I'm Jay Kingley, co-founder and CEO of Maven, your host of Fractionals Unplugged. I'm joined today by Carla Titus, a fractional chief financial officer who runs Wealth and Worth Within. Carla has been in finance for over 17 years, the last six in a fractional capacity. Carla focuses on established businesses, typically with five to 10 employees and seven to eight figures in revenue, and often in healthcare, legal, HR, interior design, and e-commerce, retail, and consumer goods. Carla is based in Portland, Oregon. Welcome, Carla. Thanks for having me, Jay, today. I'm so excited for our conversation. Welcome to Fractionals Unplugged, an insider's perspective vodcast and podcast from Maven. You've left the corporate executive world to build your own business to secure your income, savor your independence, and succeed on your terms. But you have to get past the struggles of acquiring clients, building a pipeline, and getting paid what you're worth. In this podcast, Jay Kingley, the CEO of Maven, and his guests share their best practices, tips, and tricks on how you can get out of Struggle City and into Success City and beyond. Enjoy today's episode. Carla, I'm the CEO of a $4 million revenue law practice. My practice is growing, but my profits are lagging, and I'm not sure why. We bump into each other for the first time at a networking event. You've got a maximum of 60 seconds to give me your elevator pitch. Go! Also, well, fractional CFO, I'm going to evaluate how your billable hours are impacting performance in the company and to help you achieve the margins that you need in order to recoup the mar- the profits that you're leaking right now in your business. We'll start there and then we'll go a lot deeper as we start to un- intertwine all the issues that we find starting with capacity. So, Carla, I-, I talked a little bit in the introduction about some of the industries, but can you more deeply define your what we call in marketing terms, your ICP, that's your ideal client profile in your target market. We work with very sophisticated business owners that have been in business for two, three years. They know what they're selling. They know who they're selling it to. And what they're struggling with is just the level of complexity around the finances that have really surpassed their ability or their knowledge, unless they go to school for finance themselves, in order to manage the complexity and intricate Uh, decision making that comes with the variables that lead into those financial decisions. So for example, they're thinking, can I afford to hire? But then they're also realizing that we have 10 other decisions contingent upon in order for us to be able to just make that one decision. We have to evaluate 10 extra vectors around Well, you also want to watch your 401k. You also want to rent a new space because you're out of space now that you're going to hire more people. How do we solve for all that? Plus, five or 10 other things that you have in mind. And it's just so complex that they stop on their tracks and get um, kind of stuck with making one, what seems like a simple decision. But when they come to us, we go through and work with them to evaluate all those 10 vectors that they're considering and say, from a comprehensive financial situation, we see that we have this moving pieces. And when we do the financial analysis, we get a much more concrete data-driven decision on the direction we want to take once we kind of fit the pieces into place. So financial complexity is a, a state of being that your clients are in. But I want you to put yourself in, for example, the CEO seat of one of your clients. What are the pain points that they are looking to resolve? They know that they're growing and that that growth is escaping kind of their ability to control it. And so they're lacking that control over what's happening in the business financially. Um, And they're going too fast to take the time to go evaluate what are the right financial decisions for the company. And so they keep procrastinating on that. They get frustrated. They look at their current accounting and bookkeeping team and they say, why isn't anyone advising me? (laughs) And they want someone to step in and take charge and lead the function and say, here's the priority order of the decisions we need to make today in the near future and long term to make sure that they all are aligned with each other, strategically think about where are we trying to achieve, how we're going to go about achieving it, and what are the 10 steps we need to take this week, this month, this quarter in order for us to start to make progress towards it, hold ourselves accountable, and ensure that financials are starting to show the results we want to see in the company. So what outcomes do your clients get 
when they get rid of these pain points that you've done? Well, first, they start to see a significant increase in profits. They start to see cash actually in the bank account where before maybe that wasn't there. <laughs> or it was lacking, or it wasn't as happy of a bank account as it could have been. Um, so they start to see that increased cash flow coming in in a positive way, increasing month over month, year over year. And then they're also starting to see their level of frustration with the decisions to go down because now they have the data to make better decisions, financially speaking. And also they are able to pay themselves better and continue to carry the load of growing this company because now they feel good about the work they do because they're actually being compensated fairly for their efforts and in turn, uh, ultimately building wealth outside of the business for their own personal gain. There's no doubt those are outcomes that any CEO in your target market would love to achieve. So it's not the desire to get rid of those pain points that's at issue. So why are they struggling to get rid of that pain and to get the outcomes that they really want? Because most of them are trying to solve the wrong problem. They're not really root causing what is happening in their business. For example, if they going back to this capacity issue, right, they think that their problem is I'm paying too much or I'm not, I don't have the right compensation model. And what actually is happening is they are not managing the capacity or what they need to get delivered from their team from a performance perspective that now is impacting the gross margin of the business. And they don't see the connection between that two because it's much easier to solve a compensation structure. We can just change it and make it look better, different, and think that that's going to solve the problems. But ultimately, the root cause of this is a performance issue we need to address for some people, for some maybe not, and ensure that we have the right metrics to track that performance that we can report back on and hold people accountable on. And that makes a big difference in the business profits. So I'm sure that these companies are trying all sorts of things to get to the outcomes they want, but by and large, they don't really seem to work. The things that they're trying aren't moving the needle for them. Why is that? Going back to this root cause problem, um, they're just misdiagnosing the issue at hand. And they're focused on maybe vanity metrics that they're told they need to be looking at, like top line revenue, and completely ignoring things like margins and profitability, which is really what businesses need to be focused on ultimately. As much as we want to grow up the, the top line of the company and continue to grow and such, if we don't do it in a, a stable way, in a way that we can both invest back in the business, but also take what we need out of it, then you will just find yourself making double as much and having half the profit that you did because you just overloaded in cost and don't have the right margin structure for the offers that you maybe introduce as new ones or the existing ones that are just not performing as well as they should be. When you have a problem that's important to you, then you tend to like to complain about it, right? You sit around, man, I wish I didn't have to deal with this. I wish this would go away. But it's not until it's urgent that people are willing to act. So why do you think for your ICPs that Dealing with these issues are both important and urgent for them. Well, if they're not urgent now, they're about to be. And that is because you will start to run out of money. You will stop trying to make payroll easily. And that's when it becomes too painful to bear because now we have to do very unnatural things to turn the boat around. And it's way harder than if you identify things are not going as great as they should be. Maybe I should start to focus on it now before it becomes two weeks away from payroll and you know you can't make it because there's not enough cash coming in and too much cost going out. So we want to encourage business owners to be seeking the support and help and advice, even when things are going great, because there's so much more opportunity we can capture on the upside of things than when you're already in this situation where you're just not enough money to pay the bills and you're behind and you're, you know, people are collecting from you and just getting behind and catching up is three times as hard and painful as just staying on top of it in the first place. It is often said that accounting is backwards looking while finance is future looking. So obviously we don't have certainty when it comes to the future. So what types of analysis 
should your clients be doing in order to get a grip on what potential future outcomes might be and how they can maximize the gain while they're mitigating the risk. So a lot of the work we do, like you mentioned, uh, we've been called the chief future officer nowadays recently because there's a lot of the work we do forward looking and proactively planning what might happen in a company. And this has to go hand in hand with risk mitigation strategies around what are the things that could go wrong that we're prepared for and we will not get caught by surprise because we did the scenario planning and financial analysis of like, what is the worst case? But also don't forget the more important part what if everything goes so perfectly well and we have such great opportunity and upside on the other side of it that we never prepare for that and we will be at the same situation if not worse than if things weren't sideways so the job of a cfo is to think about what are the 10 ways this could go and then draft the scenario planning financially speaking of what are the top three scenarios most likely that we think are going to be realistic and going to happen and ensure that we have a financial model that reflects what that might look like. So we tend to work in ranges, as you know, Jay, where we have a high case scenario, a most likely case scenario, and a low base case scenario for, again, risk mitigation purposes. And we say, okay, what happens when those things become reality? And also, more importantly, what are the things we are responsible for and need to do and actions we need to take and hold ourselves accountable for in order for that scenario to be more likely for us to happen. And now guess what? You have the data now because you know what's going to happen if that is the case and you're no longer surprised. Now you can react from a position of power and control because when that happens, we got to hire 10 people and we have six months to do it. Let's go. So we're not waiting for it to happen to us. We know exactly what we need to go do when that happens. Carla, you, I think quite perceptively talked about the real root cause being complexity and it isn't so much complexity about the past, it's complexity about how you have to think about the future and the myriad of variables and along with all the different values they take and how they interact. And I think that the type of analysis that you're talking about is the only way practically to simplify that complexity so that you understand the couple, three things that are really important, and you can focus on being proactive and not being frozen deer in headlights because you are overwhelmed. So given that insight that you've shared with us on what underlies why this is so difficult, what are the steps that they need to take to get out of what I like to call their struggle city and move into success city. Uh, so what you said is critical. Uh, first, that um, reactive approach to business only got you this far. It's probably not going to get you to the next level. So shifting your thinking to strategic direction setting and proactive planning rather than waiting for things to happen to you, go craft the scenarios that you want your business to achieve and how you want to see the business perform financially. It's going to put you in that driver's seat instead of being a passenger in the backseat, just waiting for a crash to happen because nobody's driving the car. And then second... Think about the fact that uncertainty is really hard to deal with. And I always tell my business owners is if you have not practiced being in uncertainty or have worked in uncertain scenarios before, it's going to be really hard for you to make decisions if you don't know what the future holds or what's the most likely scenario. And CFOs are trained in their expertise and experience to deal with uncertainty at many different levels and also connect the dots between decision A, B, C, D and bring it all together to a cohesive financial plan that tells you here's the steps we're going to take in order to address this. And yes, that was one question that actually took on four extra variables <laughs> that we have to account for and factor that you need to make decisions on that affect the ultimate decision we want to make as a business. You know, it, it, it reminds me, um, of that famous quote, and I know that I'm going to uh, date myself, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, who was uh, at one point Secretary of Defense back in 2002, uh, made his uh, famous quote that said that reports say that something hasn't happened are always interesting to me, because as we know, there are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. 
That is to say, there are some things we do not know, but there are also unknown unknowns, the ones we know, we don't know, we don't know. And if one looks through the history of our country and other free countries, it is the latter category that tends to be the difficult ones. Yeah, I remember when he first said that, and everyone's like, huh? But he was sort of right about that. <laughs> um, in any event, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to learn a bit about Carla. You've spent the last 25 or more years working your way up the corporate ladder, achieving success and reward along the way. Whether corporate kicked you to the curb or you walked out the door of your own volition, there is no going back. You're nowhere close to retiring, so you're moving on to your second act as a fractional executive. You're feeling the thrill of freedom mixed with the dread of the unknown. You're not alone. Maven works with the elite 20%, turning the top fractional executives' aspirations into reality easily and quickly. Imagine the right clients needing your genius, chasing you to get it, and happy to pay you for the impact you make. Maven helps you build all aspects of your business to fund your lifestyle without having to work corporate hours. With Maven, market yourself easily, select your clients with purpose, and build a business that leverages your genius on your terms, not on someone else's. Reach out to Jay at j.kingley at referabilitymaven.com. Transform your expertise into a prosperous business where you'll make the impact you want with all the freedom, flexibility, and control that you've earned. Welcome back. We're talking to Carla Titus, a fractional chief finance officer focused on companies making seven to eight figures in revenue. Carla, let's find out a bit more about you. And I want to start with asking you about the experiences that you have had in your career that enabled you to develop the insights that you shared with us that you have, and in my experience, so many of your competitors don't. My background is really based on uh, my corporate finance uh, career of 11 years. And I spent a lot of time as an analyst, as well as senior roles, uh, understanding the numbers and what was driving variables and variances, explaining a lot of the storytelling behind the data for the decision makers in the company, BP level people trying to decide, should we do A, B or C? What does the data say? And, you know, what are our, again, opportunities or risk we need to watch out for? And then taking the time to just deeply analyze what those alternatives could be, maybe brainstorming or collaborating on those, and then ultimately putting the financial analysis together to present, let's go with A or B or C, depending on what we're trying to recommend. Taking into account the strategic direction of the company and obviously the goals that we have for the organization that we're supporting and also a budget in mind because, you know, we have to manage to our budget as well and make sure that we're making those best decisions with the data we had really helped me kind of gain that big understanding on like the function that a finance counterpart plays in the decision making of company goals and, and decisions that they have to make to make the company achieve their goals, make sure that we're tracking to the right KPIs and then developing that sense of, you know, consultative advisory uh, partnership that came with the organizations we support and making sure that we have access to the right information to make the right decisions. One of my favorite questions is to ask what happened in your life, could be personal, could be professional, that most explains why you're doing what you do today? Well, I definitely have a passion for knowledge around finances. And that started really young in my life. Actually, I have a mom who's an accountant. And so we talked a lot about budgets and we did a lot of math in our house and we <laughs> had to know our stuff when it came to numbers. So this was just the normal everyday life at home. And I took a lot of um, pleasure in knowing that I was really good at math. Like obviously it came with the territory of having a mom as an accountant. <laughs> we did a lot of math around home and we had really high expectations on what we needed to do. And then also I really enjoy like managing money and budgeting and allocating to the right places, being prepared for opportunities for my own personal uh, decisions that I had to make. Because at the end of the day, we all know that everything that we do in life Unfortunately, reverse of our money or fortunately reverse of our money. And it's how you see it and how you manage it that's really going to help you either get ahead in life or 
get behind at times, right? And so that lack of education really made me think that, oh my God, not everybody had access to an accountant mom at home talking about money all the time. And especially not business owners who are running businesses because they love what they do. They want to do more of it. They want to have all the impact they want to have. But guess what gets in the way of them? Money. Because they haven't learned it. They haven't managed it. They don't know how to control it. And there's this big gap on education lack of education or knowledge around money that I'm trying to close to empower more business owners to be in business longer, to really have that positive impact they want to have. And they can't have impact if they don't have money, Jay. Couldn't agree more. That's the lubricant that makes the world work. So what's next for you over the coming 12 months? Well, we are actually growing and looking to impact more business owners with the support that we provide. Um, we do everything from bookkeeping professionally for companies that are growing, that are maybe struggling with their current support and need a little bit of an up level um, bookkeeping team on their side, as well as more fractional CFO um, consulting roles that we can support this growing businesses that are struggling with the decisions that we talked about or trying to make the decisions and not having access to the right analysis or data to make it by partnering with them to be their fractional CFO, because you and I know they don't need a full-time person yet, but they definitely need the expertise and access and understanding of what the numbers are telling. So if we've got business owners who are listening in and are interested in starting a conversation with you, what is the best way for them to contact you? They can reach us on our website at wealthworthwithin.com. There's a contact tab where you can book a free call. Let's talk about if you're ready to hire a fractional CFO, how we might be able to meet your financial support needs. If you want to follow along, you're not ready to hire one yet. You can sign up for our newsletter. We put a lot of uh, thought leadership and things that we are helping our clients with and they're struggling with right now on that newsletter to share with you just a little bit more on how to close the gap around the struggles that you have in your business today and how you might be able to fix them. And if nothing else, follow us on social media at Wealth Worth Within. We're on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. We will put Carla's contact information in our show notes for both our podcast and our video. Carla, I want to thank you for being a guest on our Fractionals Unplugged show. Be sure to subscribe to both our podcasts on all the major platforms and our YouTube channel for our videos. Until next time, make an impact on your clients and family on your terms, securing your independence with the freedom, flexibility, and control that you've earned.